Liebe verehrte Gäste, herzlich willkommen zurück. Jetzt wird es wieder spannend. Unser nächster Gast weiß, wie man erfolgreich internationale Unternehmen transformiert. Das Manager Magazin hat sie gerade zu einer der einflussreichsten Wirtschaftsfrauen ausgezeichnet. Julie Lynn Techland ist EY Managing Partnerin für Europa, Afrika, Indien und den Mittleren Osten. Sie leitet damit über 120.000 Mitarbeitende aus 100 verschiedenen Ländern. Was sie will, Werte schaffen, Umsatz steigern, Kosten senken und natürlich Innovationen vorantreiben. Ihre persönliche Motivation ist, Organisationen auf ihrem Weg der Transformation zu unterstützen, um in einer digitalisierten Welt langfristige wirtschaftliche und soziale Wirkungen zu erzielen. Wie sie das in ihrem Alltag schafft, das erfahren wir jetzt im Gespräch Julie Lynn Tegland mit Dr. Uwe Jan Häuser, dem Chef unseres Ressorts Green. Hello, Julie Tegland. It's very good to have you with us today. I'm really pleased to be with you. It's going to be a great conversation. Well, um, I hope so, and I'm sure your part will be. Julie, um, we're talking about the green transformation today. And, and first of all, I'm wondering, what is your personal motivation when it comes to, to climate and nature? Oh, that's a great, that's a really great question. It's a, it's a little bit of a personal question. You know that I'm a partner, and as a partner in a large firm, a lot of our beliefs deal with legacy and leaving a legacy. I have a very strong personal belief that we need to leave a legacy for the future, for the younger generation. And I, I say that not just because I have four children, but also because I love working with the younger generation. You might know that I sit as a board member of Junior Achievement. We work all across the world, helping the younger generation entrepreneurially work on the problems of the future. And one of those problems is looking at climate change, the green revolution, transformation. And it is so exciting and motivating, Uva, to see how the next generation grasps, tackles, and tries to conquer those problems. So I have a personal motivation with my children, but a professional one in leaving a legacy And as a board member, one to help the next generation really accomplish what they would like for the future. And, and how do your children react to your work and, and with regard to, to climate change? Are they happy that you're working sort of on helping sort of companies and capitalists? <laughs> I think they're less happy about the capitalists, Uwe. That's a That was a sneaky comment that you snuck in there. I think they're more happy that we're really helping the world in, in sustainability and climate change. And um, I'm happy to play a part in that, whether it's helping the companies transform faster or changing the capital allocation to invest more in sustainability. Julie, was there a special moment, like a Eureka moment, where, where you all of a sudden saw the importance of the climate issue? You know, I, I don't think there was a Eureka moment. I can remember though, I, and I will say it's quite a few years back when my children started raising the issues with my kids challenging how we're using electricity and what we're eating every day and forcing us as a family to really start to rethink those things way before the EU got on board with taxonomy discussions and regulations and green revolutions. I think the younger generation was really leading the way in starting to raise their hand and say, we need to think about how we look at our resources for the future a lot differently. And I, I think maybe that wasn't one Eureka moment, but probably when your son says something three times, four times, five times, you start to say, hey, they are thinking really differently about the future. Uh, green investors say today that helping the environment and you know, furthering growth and profit go hand in hand. Do we, are we really at that stage? I think it's hard to argue that growth and profit are driven solely by green investments. And I think we have to be honest about that. 
Do green investments also drive growth and profitability? Yes, they do. And increasingly, investors are focused more and more on only making investments that combine the two aspects. A green aspect of having a longer term sustainable product or future combined with that short term desire to make profits. And they're trying to bring those together under one hat. I think as we embark further on this green revolution, you're gonna see more and more sustainability and profits come together to unite. We're not that far yet, Uwe, and I, I think we should be honest about where we are and where we're not. Honesty definitely helps, Julie. The, uh, what do your clients actually uh, ask of you? What do they demand from EY in terms of sustainability? What are their needs? I, I think today, if I look at what CEOs are talking about, Uva, they're asking for, for five things. They're looking at their company strategy and they're saying, is my strategy sustainable longer term? Do I have a good plan for how I'm going to get to net zero and beyond? Can I sell that to the markets? Secondly, they're looking at if they're doing green investments and strategy and innovation, they're asking is my operating model fit for a purpose? Do I need to create almost a sandbox, a separate company to drive that innovation, to experiment? And so they're asking EY for help. Can you help us build that? They're reevaluating. The third point would be support functions. Have they looked at their supply chain? Have they evaluated, are, is their supply chain sustainable? Does it meet the future reporting requirements? Or do they have that transparency? Then they're asking us for support on data management and IT. All of the regulations that the EU is con contemplating is around how to really collect and manage the data to increase transparency in the market. Our clients across the world are having issues on how do we do that? Where do we get the data? How do we do that in an automated process? How do we report it transparently and consistently? And the last but not least, Uva, a lot of our clients are asking us for help on the question of talent. How do they increase the level of diversity to increase their story on sustainability? How do they motivate their younger generations and their people in with the sustainable journey of the future? And how do they excite them? Because it is an exciting topic. The younger generation are really passionate about this. And rightfully so. Sometimes when I when I listen to companies and their sustainability statements, I wonder how much they actually know about their their emissions and their, their ecological footprint. Um, how far are we with that? I think we're midway, and that's a that's a terrible answer. I think people have a good understanding of their scope one emissions, what they directly imitate, what they have. I think scope two, it's it's even, I won't say it's easier, but it's also reportable. If I look at scope three, Uva, I'll be really honest, this is in many industries very, very difficult for companies to get a handle on. How do you know what your entire supply chain is, is emitting? How do you calculate that? How do you report it on a regular basis? Especially when a lot of the companies down the chain are smaller middle market companies that are still grappling with the entire concept. Until we have a unified taxonomy and clarity on what's reported when, where, applicable for all, there's not going to be that level of transparency. I would say we're midway. I do think companies have a better handle today on what they're emitting and where across their scope one and scope two. We've got a ways to go to get clarity on scope three. And to be honest, that's going to take time. Mm. Time is something that climate doesn't really allow us to have. Um, so what's the fastest way? Is it, is it a digital answer that we need, an interconnection, or how, how can you make true on your promise, which EY actually makes, to help clients with transparency, transparency and control over their emissions, which probably also includes scope three emissions? It does. I think the first step is to ask the regulators for their support. And I know in the context of this conference, you'll be speaking to many of the regulators, I think our clients require clarity on regulation and what's going to be required of them. Until there, that's clarity, Uva. It's really hard to have clients make 
actually long-term investment decisions on reporting systems, on defining taxonomy, when there's no clarity from the regulatory side. Once the clarity is there, we can help clients make the right decisions in terms of defining reporting mechanisms and systems to help gather the data, collect it, and report on it transparently. Today, there's so many different frameworks out there. We're encouraging clients to select one, move towards the taxonomy, and get a good understanding of what their emissions are and how they report. We're also encouraging clients really to look at, instead of just looking at the short-term historical metrics, look at longer-term value metrics that really align with that long-term value view to be able to report on that. Looking at the impact that companies are having on people, on planet, on prosperity, and of course on governance to really align with the overall concept of ESG. Uh, it's actually something you hear a lot today from many companies saying we we first need a well, we need a um, regulatory framework that we can rely on. Can't you just overachieve? Can't you just say no matter what the regulations are going to be, I'm going to be way ahead of them? I think a lot of the first movers today can be considered overachievers, right? Those that are reporting already on their admissions and making every attempt are overachieving. And actually, you can see by looking at analyst reviews that they're meeting analyst expectations. So partially, you're right, Uva. Just pick one of the frameworks and go with it. But let's be honest, adapting to the framework takes time, and it takes also capital. We've got to make sure that we drive that in the clearest possible way. I think leaving completely this issue for until the regulators finally decide is the wrong answer. Every company needs to get on the journey to start grappling with it, design their path towards net zero, acknowledge that they're scientific targets, and we are going to have to report at least on scope one and scope two in some shape or fashion. EY has a, a wonderful name for, for a unit that, that, that seems to do great things. It's called the, the Sustainable Impact Hub. Um, tell us what exactly you're doing there. Our Sustainable Impact Hub does great things in helping companies really focus on achieving their sustainability goals overall. It's a group of experts that's really dedicated exactly to that. We have a number of solutions in this area. That's only one of them. Our EY Carbon solution is a second, where we're helping companies design their strategic journey towards decarbonization with all of the respective capital allocations that are needed along the way. We just uh, ran a story, big story about the, the, the new wave of green startups, uh, which are trying to revolutionize basically every industry and um, sort of give answers that the big companies don't give. Are they um, a, a true challenge? Are they actually challenging the livelihood of the big companies of your clients? Or are they going to help competition and, and foster innovation in a in sort of in a, in a more, uh, in a less disruptive way? I think it's both. I think you've got three groups of companies today. You've got the ones that are transforming to transform. Those are the ones like tech companies or professional services Uva, that are helping other transform. You've got companies that are transforming to win. Those are the ones that are really changing, that are investing, innovating, coming up with new solutions, driving the market. If you think about all the vegan plant type foods that are created today, all of that is a new market that didn't exist before. Those are challengers. They've created the market. They're transforming to win and to establish themselves. And you've got a whole sectors that really need to transform to just stay alive. And those sectors are the ones, for example, in the chemical industry and in the energy sector. They're transforming because they have to transform in order to maintain and to change, keeping their business proposition for the future. And they are sometimes challenged by a few of the innovations that are out there. There's so much happening on that green space. It's almost like a green revolution, consistent with what we saw in the Industrial Revolution almost 150 years ago. Are there, are there green innovations that you are particularly excited about? 
Oh, there's amazing innovations. Have you heard about the one in Japan, an enzyme that they've they've actually accidentally found an enzyme that can eat the plastic in the ocean waters and have it disappear? I, I'm amazingly excited about that because think of what it would do for our fish consumption. It would make it far healthier, far safer, and our waters far cleaner. So there's some great stuff on the potas or on the precip of coming out. So I'm, I'm really excited about this will do, not just from our economic perspective, but from an innovation perspective and technology perspective. You're responsible for, for EY in, um, in three continents, basically. So you have a big overview. What do you think is, you know, where are the biggest challenging uh, challenges, moments of challenging for, for the green transformation? Which are the problems that still have to be solved? I think the biggest problem that out there is capital allocation, Uva. I think companies understand where they need to go on their sustainability journey. I think we all have to acknowledge it's going to cost a boatload of money to be able to do that and to make that affordable and to make the companies be able to afford that investment. That requires some time and a lot of money. And so looking together with the companies on how you can stretch that investment over time to make it affordable, but still have the necessary impact. That's the strategy point that's really important that involves a lot of financial modeling and an understanding of where those business models are going. As we move to the emerging markets, Uva, that challenge gets even greater. That capital allocation is even more pertinent and more difficult to spread that financing. I'm confident that everybody's going to get there, but arranging how we afford this is going to be a huge component of the transformation. We're coming out of an era of cheap money and, and low interest rates. Now, now it seems that due to inflation and also reactions of the central banks, this might change. Is this going to hamper the green revolution? I think it'll. I think you could ask yourself if this is a chicken or an egg question. And the reason I say that is because we all know that in inflation, energy prices are included in that. And the energy choices we make will, will create issues. Being more sustainable for the future is going to cause inflation to rise. Food prices will go up. Energy prices will go up. That speaks even more to the, the idea of efficient ecology, meaning you do the things that really work and that help uh, first. And um, yeah. So I'm wondering, what is overlooked most in, in, in the industries? Which, which are steps that, that you advise to take that are often forgotten about? That's a good question. You know what I think? Um, I think we often look towards the large capital allocation projects, the big movements, Uva. Sometimes I think we forget that the smaller things have even a larger impact. And when I talk about sustainability, I often we talk about what we can do, not just looking at large corporations to make large changes for us globally, but to look at what each and every one of us can do. Having an impact on, on climate change or having an impact on carbon emissions can also be done with us personally deciding what we eat each and every day and making small changes to have a very large impact. I often think we overlook those very small changes that are necessary. If all of our employees worldwide would make changes like that, you'd also see an impact very quickly without a whole lot of capital allocation in the first step. Of course, this transformation also gives incentives to, to greenwash, if possible. Do, do, you, do you see greenwashing with your clients? Do you, do you see... Um, also sort of incentives to greenwash? I think there's a lot of incentives to greenwash out there today. When you look at the markets, when you look at financing that are really looking for that green flavor as a method of qualifying in or out of certain financing arrangements, as an example, we look at investors who are really looking at the strategy of the company and there, there is an incentive to have it appear more sustainable. We look at the talent attraction market and let's be honest, to attract younger folks, you want to be a little bit greener than maybe you are. So the incentive is there. 
I do think having solid reporting systems and control frameworks help protect against greenwashing so that companies, boards can stand behind their strategy as well as their numbers to protect them from greenwashing. It's a little bit of holding them honest. Sometimes you don't like that, but it's healthy and it's good for you. And it shows that we're all on this journey. So what do you do when you detect a major case of greenwashing? What's, what's your sort of take on this, your psychological answer? How do you get people on the right track again? I think you have to have a good, open and honest conversation about what the original intent was uh, with both management and the board to make sure that we haven't missed anything, but that they understand why someone could take the view that it is greenwashing. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, there are also companies that simply cheat. I mean, it has always been sure. the case. Um, and I, but with today's stage of transparency, can we be pretty confident that there are no big greenwashing cases coming our way? No, I think I would be cautious about that. I don't think we've reached the end of greenwashing, Uva. I think we're still at the very beginning. And as this gathers in importance and gathers in transparency, companies who want to cheat will need to go further out of their way. The more the regulators tighten up the mechanics of what needs to be reported by when, the harder it's going to be to greenwash to keep that consistent story. I always say in the end, you've probably told this to your children, in the end, the truth always comes out. The question is how long it takes for it to be discovered. Yes, I do remember having said this at times, and I'm not sure my children believe me, but um, <laughs> I, I keep telling you. I can them. tell them it's true. It's true. <laughs> so we talk about your clients, but of course, of course, also you run part of a, of a big company, and you alone are responsible for more than 100,000 people. So how does EY have to change internally um, to be a more sustainable company? We've, we've set our path towards becoming net zero by 2025. And this is a big change for us, Uva. We've committed to it. We've said we need to reduce our own emissions with NEY by 40%. This is huge because our emissions are largely driven by the work that we do with clients. It means 35% less travel for all of our employees. It means a commitment to change the electricity in, or I should say the energy consumption in every one of our buildings across, you know, 180 countries. It's a huge commitment for us. This is a big change. And we need all of our people to support this change and to help us reduce those emissions. But that's only the one way that EY needs to change. This is kind of what I call walking the talk. We can't talk about helping others on their journey to net zero if we haven't done it ourselves. We have to do this. We have to take this pain. But on the other hand, we also have a commitment to train our 300,000 people in sustainability to make them aware so that they can make good choices and so that they can help advise others, whether they're looking at auditing or tax advising for what's coming with the plastic tax or the carbon tax mechanisms, or how it impacts the valuation of a company, or how it impacts their SAP systems and their data transfer. So we have a big job to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of what's happening with regulation, what's happening with the taxonomy, what's happening across the globe, and make sure that all of our 300,000 people can share this knowledge, obviously to differing levels, but are part of this journey. I think those are the two biggest ways that we have to change. Makes sense. Of course, um, newspapers also can't really write about the green transformation when they don't do it themselves. But the... Um, um, what, how do you find, uh, where do you see the biggest problems in, in taking along your employees and in, in making everybody take the turn? In my experience, I've, I've been in this business 30 years, Uva, and when you, um, when you clap your hands and you say, okay, guys, now we're going to change, I can say that normally they all look at you and they say, I'm happy for the change as long as somebody else does it. The biggest part of taking everybody along is to make sure that they want to do the change, they feel that it's motivating for them, and they feel that it benefits them. 
The good thing about climate change is everybody can see the direct benefits of better air, better water, a healthier environment. The harder thing is to draw the line between those good effects and the personal behavior. Every change is difficult, Uva, and you've got to make that motivation, that connectivity to make them want to do it and be part of that journey. The advantage, I think, is as I started this conversation, our younger generations, our children, they're up for this. They're ready for this change. They're willing to give up their steak dinners and, and even their travel. They're changing their ways, and this is great to see. Well, unfortunately, they're also willing to, to give up my steak dinners, but never mind. Um, <laughs> this uh, is very true. They're less fussed about your steak dinners, I can say, than their own. <laughs> but um, and since you, you, you know, thank you for your honesty in, in many regards today, since we're being honest. Um, because there, there, there is the story that basically the younger generation of employees these days is, is sort of a self-starter. In, in the sense that they all are climate minded and, and they want the company to do good things. Is that really true? I think that's really true. I, I think that's true. I think we should say that it's true. But I also think when it comes down to, do I need to spend four hours on a train versus 40 minutes on a flight, then you start to make the decision very personal. And then people need to take other things into account when they're making that decision. It's very easy to say the company, neutral, i.e. someone else, should do great things and should change and be 100% sustainable. When it comes to personal choices, Uva, I notice that it gets a little bit harder. But in general, I feel really confident our younger generation wants this and we need this to leave a great legacy for them. Julie, there are, you know, companies and, and industries that, for example, an investment company like BlackRock, the biggest of them all, doesn't yeah. invest in anymore. Are there also companies or industries that you don't work for anymore? I think not yet, Uva, but I think the day will come. And the reason I say that is we, we have a very tough uh, process for client acceptance. And one of the things that we ask is, is it aligned with our values? Today, companies are still on that journey towards sustainability, and we want to help them on that journey. Companies that in the future don't want to get on the journey or want to avoid the journey or want to greenwashing, you mentioned previously, we at EY would not be willing to work with them. But we're still a ways away from that. We're at the very beginning of the journey, and being optimistic and hopeful. I'm hoping we're going to get every company on the journey with us. Mm -hmm. And you are also you're a big proponent of, of innovation with regard to your clients um, and, and also within EY. With regard to green innovation, Julie, um, so how do you foster this internally instead of waiting for some startup to show you how it's done? You know, we have a whole team over that focuses on that. One of the things that we've kind of tried to propagate was the best way to innovate is to really give it space to grow, to encourage that innovation culture and make sure that the processes that you have in an organization, for example, even in our own organization, don't kill it. And so our idea is create a small sandbox that where you can see the idea, let the team work on the idea, remove them from the standard process of a company so that it can flourish, you can test it, it can fail and it can fail fast. If it works well, you can bring it back into the organization. But if you bring it back in too early, Uva, I notice a tendency that it gets squelched with our standard business processes. And so if you really wanna drive innovation, you have to foster a culture of innovation and you have to find a way to protect it, especially when it's still not completely established. Thank you very much, Julia. That makes a lot of sense. And, and um, thank you for the whole conversation, um, for being honest on many accounts and, um, and taking us um, on this whole loop that we took. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great conversation. All right. Thanks, Julie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.